Hello everyone and happy Wednesday evening. I hope, uh, hope everyone is well. Uh, we wanted to share in the Word today um, the book of Acts chapter 17 and we're going to start in verse 16. Acts chapter 17 starting in verse 16. It's a pretty familiar passage. I think a lot of, a lot of you guys will remember this uh, to, to some extent. Um, but just a wonderful um, um, occurrence here that happened with Paul. Um, and I think we could pull from there a lot of wise words uh, from Paul and from the Lord. Um, the hope is that we are encouraged, that we are strengthened, that the Lord is glorified in what we share and what we learn. So uh, thank you uh, very much for giving your kind attention. So we're going to start in uh, verse 16. Now while Paul was waiting for them, so basically they're coming from Berea, he's waiting on Silas and Timothy. Uh, and he's waiting in uh, Athens, okay? So he's in Greece, um, he's in Athens. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him, and he saw that the city was full of idols. So right off the bat, he's in a, he's in a place, he's in a, um, uh, a Gentile area, um, and there's a lot of uh, foreign gods, a lot of idols that are around there. And he's provoked, he's agitated. Now I'm agitated a lot. I, I look around, I see things that bother me. And a lot of them have nothing to do with uh, people's worship. Uh, just things that bug me. Um, and then a lot of them do. I, I see some things that are, whether it's a, something political perhaps, something amoral, uh, and, I, and I get stirred up a bit. So I, and I think we've got to be careful there. I think we've got to watch at uh, what provokes us. Um, we need to be careful not to get angry. We need to be understanding of these things and also how we react to these things. Um, there's a lot of Christians, and I, I could fall into this too, where we walk around like these judging snobs, and it does not help anything. And we are in no position to be judging people because we're, we're knuckleheads ourselves. So we gotta be real careful with this. Um, when we look around and we see the events, the people, things that are going on, to be patient, uh, to be kind, very important. But even Paul, he's provoked, he's agitated. Uh, but let's see what he does. Verse 17, so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. There you go. Did he fly off the handle? Did he get mad? No. Did he start um, um, preaching fire and brimstone to these people? They didn't do that either. He finds the people that are devout, and even the Jews, because we know that even in the Old Testament, the Jewish people had idols, and they were going to synagogue. So Paul takes these people, at least where he has a common ground with them, and he begins to explain to them about idols and about God. He finds some people where he could at least begin to share and to reason with them and to explain. Um, and anyone who's there. So he goes to the places where people may be coming in looking for some answers, like a synagogue. Um, now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't knock anyone who wants to stand on a, on a corner and just start preaching. I've seen people do that. Wouldn't knock them at all. Wouldn't doubt their zeal or their enthusiasm or their, or I, I may question the effectiveness. I don't know if it's a great way to witness. I, I think that in with Paul, with Christ, with Peter, it seemed that the audience, there was people gathered for a reason. They wanted to hear. Um, and I think that's a place you need to start when people are out there just preaching and sometimes Bible thumping and people don't even want to hear it. They want to shop, uh, they're, they're, they're getting their groceries, whatever it is. My feeling is it may be less effective. But in this case, he, at least he goes to the synagogue and he's in the marketplace and just some people that happen to be there and the people that have some common ground. He begins to reason and explain with them. Verse 18, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities 
because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Now, first of all, they're referring to him as a babbler. Uh, Paul doesn't care. Uh, if they're going to invite him to speak, he's going to go. doesn't matter if they're offensive or rude. doesn't matter. After all, this is a very foreign philosophy to them. The, um, the Greeks were thinkers. Aristotle, Plato, um, you know, thought and uh, where we came from, all these things were important to these people. The Epicureans in particular, their, their philosophy was that, um, yeah, there are a lot of pleasures in life and it's okay to seek them, uh, but you got to be careful. You can't just go and everything you want going after it. You've got to limit what things you desire and focus on those. If you're, if you're into too many things, it's going to bring you down. The, uh, which, which is uh, very rational and yeah, probably smart too. I think we all need to do that. The Stoics, on the other hand, kind of looked at things as more, uh, a bit more realistic perhaps. They felt that you're going to have tragedy in life. And that is completely up to the goddess uh, Fortuna, or F Fortuna, uh, who is the goddess of luck. So if she decides to bring some misfortune your way, well, you're going to have to deal with it. And the better you are at handling misfortune and being prepared for it, the better off you're going to be. So whether you're an Epicurean, a Stoic, you want they want to live up to these uh, these beliefs that they had and in hope to perfect them so that they could be a sage of sorts a wise man in the eyes of themselves and of the people and there's all kind of philosophies but at least these people are thinking at least they have somewhat of a realistic approach to life nowadays we got materialism and it's all about the stuff and boy, that could really be destructive. Um, the stuff that you have already, the stuff that you want, what you're willing to do to get it. Materialism is tough, and it's been tough on America, and certainly not, not, no way to live our lives. But at least these people are thinkers. At least they're seekers. They're looking for the truth. Um, they may not agree on it when they hear it, but many of them may. So it's good, just the philosophy these days, I, I think we may be better with people that are at least thinking and seeking uh, than people are satisfied with our stuff because we may lose our stuff one day. And many of us have already lost it. And there's certainly no happiness in there. And perhaps the day we lose some of our stuff, our ability to acquire it, that may change things. We may look in our hearts for other things and hopefully that will be the Lord uh, to find our satisfaction. But they are, they're, so, so they go and they, they don't, they, they find that he's a, he's a preacher of foreign divinities. Um, he's talking about Jesus and the resurrection, which is completely foreign to them. Verse 19, and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. Now the Areopagus or Mars Hill is where the counselor, the council met. So he's bringing them before the leaders of the city in Athens. Um, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? There's an interest that they have. Paul is given a wonderful opportunity. He looks around, he's agitated by what he sees, by the idol worship. He begins to reason with some people where he has a common ground with and with others that are willing to listen. And now he has an invitation to speak before the council. The Lord has orchestrated this for Paul, but him being patient and wise has helped in putting him in this position. Uh, verse 20, for you bring some strange things to our ears. They've not heard this before. Uh, they don't have the, the foundation that the Jews had. And that Old Testament is so important, even understanding the New Testament. They didn't have it, the Greeks. They did not have this. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. That's what they did. They like to sit around and talk about this stuff. I think that's pretty cool. You would think you would have this kind of thought, I hope we would, in our college campuses. Where, yeah, you're hearing some new philosophies, and sure, they're not going to push Christianity. It should be included. 
but they're going to push these different thoughts and these different religions and kids are going to sit around and talk about it. I think that's all right, you know, um, because when you have that open-mindedness, when you're willing to seek, that is when the, when the gospel could come in and open the minds and the hearts of people. Nowadays, our college campuses are all about global warming. Uh, white people are evil. Rich people are evil. It's so, we've gotten so away from exploration and openness just to being uh, fed uh, what's true and what's important, but it's really not true and not important. Unfortunate. But this group wants to hear. They want to hear. Verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. And you have to wonder if there's a little sarcasm there, a little tongue-in-cheek. I don't know. He's probably looking around. He sees all the idols and everything and says, yeah, you might, I, I perceive you're religious. It's like going into the Vatican and saying that to the Pope. Yeah, hey, you seem like a very spiritual man. Uh, so he, he says that to them. And maybe he wasn't. Maybe, I'm sure it was very sincere. But he's, he's trying <coughs> to make an appeal to these people. Verse 23. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. Now even there, you know, hey, these, these things are idols. These are gods to these people. He refers to them as objects of their worship. It's true, but a little, little risky even in using that phrase. I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this is what I proclaim to you. And this is brilliant. This is absolutely brilliant. Uh, Paul's got a way in. He's not offending these people. Um, and he has this unknown God, and he's going to elaborate on that. Because truly, Christ Jesus, uh, Yahweh, is an unknown God to them. Perfect opening. He's smart. Um, verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So immediately this unknown God He's proclaiming him as being sovereign, as being one God. He provides everything for us, for them. Um, much different. Typically, they had gods for different things, several gods that they would appeal to. Uh, gods that often uh, took on human characteristics, so they weren't so high and lofty. If you bring God down a little bit, or the gods... Well, now your mistakes and your um, being human and your mishaps aren't as bad because they made the same kind of mistakes. But no, Paul is talking about the one and true God, this God who has made everything. He doesn't live in temples. You can't serve him because he doesn't need anything. He is only going to give to you by his grace. Verse 26, And he made from one man, Adam, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Amazing. So Paul points out he says he has he has set everything, he's created the earth, and he's determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Um, <clears throat> Mark touched on this on Sunday. It is the Lord that determines, okay? Um, Alexander the Great, you're going to have this amount of years that you're going to reign, and you're going to go thus far. Um, Hitler... As wicked and nasty as you are, I'm going to allow this much time, this much conquering. Um, whoever it is, President Bush, you're going to reign in this part of the world for this amount of time. Everyone 
Trump, Biden, he has set these things up for an allotted time. As things change in the big picture, is he still the God that gives us our breath, that provides for us, that loves us, that everything was made for him and about him? Not changed a bit. It is an allotted time and a boundary that each ruler has. It's just an amount of space and time that he has allotted, that he has given, that he has allowed, that in his sovereign will, he has permitted. So, as we look forward to our country, our families, our education, all these things that concern us in life, remember, the Lord has all things under control. We need not worry, be fretful, uh, uh, devastated, giving up. Everything in his, in his hands, the good times, the bad times, how we need to understand that, how I need to understand that. And it said that he set the, the allotted periods, the boundary of the dwelling place, that they should seek God and feel their way toward him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. So the purpose of these allotted times and boundaries is to turn the hearts of the man of man toward him that they would perhaps seek him that they would feel some sort of compulsion to realize that the materialistic things that I've always pursued and loved in my life they're gone now what's left to understand that even though I didn't have love from this one this one's failed me my wife my father my kids whatever it is to understand the desire to seek after him and to find that truth in him. These things are all arranged by our Lord. And Paul is explaining this um, to the Greeks. He's explaining it to us because we need to understand it as well. Now, verse 28, he says, For in him, in God, we live and move and have our being. We live, we move, we have our being. And again, these are things that the Greeks, the philosophers, the sages, the students, they wrestled with these things, these eternal truths. Where does life come from? What, what am I? What is a state of being? Um, uh, you know, the movement, what, what is it that moves us? They examined these things and they sought after the truth. So Paul, in that one statement, is wrapping up all sorts of questions that they have. <clears throat> now, in the Greek, when they say, when he said to live, that referred more to the physical being, um, our breathing, our eating, our you know physical movement, more to the more to the animalistic part of this. Um, when he used the word move, in him we move, that referred more to our passions our fears, our desires, our loves, our trusts, our mistrusts. And then finally, our being. Um, that had to do with the actual essence of who we are. The intellect, the will, the heart, the soul of man. And Paul is saying that Christ is all of these things. The physical. He is the emotional part of us. He is the actual will and essence of who we are. Not just that he created these things, but through him we have all these things and we are these things. So when you when you see that God is so consistent and pursuant of mankind and the need for him is so great, this is why. He's everything. It, he is everything to us. That's the plan, that is the design, to live our lives through him and with him. Not just on Sundays, not just part-time, but always. It's so critical. <clears throat> and it said, um, continuing with verse 28, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. And he's quoting from one of the, one of the Greek poets of the time, whose name I can't pronounce. It's not that important. But it is good to know that Paul was kind of in tune with the culture, even the culture he didn't live in. 
he was in tune with what was going on around him. And that's a good thing. You know, sometimes people feel like, oh, we're Christians, we have to be locked in our little bubbles, and you know, we have no idea what's going on in the world around us. I, I don't think that's terribly wise. I think it's okay and necessary to have our, our, our have a pulse of what's going on in the world around us. Okay, verse 29. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone or an image formed by the art and imagination of man. It's very logical. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Oh, now he's getting, now he's getting a little preachy here. Now he's doing a little Bible thumping. He's presented the gospel in a very, very um, well thought out, understandable way, especially to the thinker. Now he's saying God's will is for you to turn away from the nonsense that you've been wrapped up in. Turn away from this idol worship. Turn away from this frivolous thought and these desires you may follow. Turn away from those things because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, Christ. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So now he's bringing the Son of God specifically in. This God that's made everything and that you, every, every move you make is a part of, he, is, he desires that you repent and turn away from things that are evil and turn to him because one day you will be judged by Jesus. And just to make sure you understand who he is, he has risen him from the dead. So do you understand that? And he is going to judge. Verse 32. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. You're going to get that. Definitely going to get that. But... Others said, we will hear you again about this. So I didn't want to give them a return visit. So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed. Among whom were uh, Dionysius and Arapagite, nah, sorry, and a woman named uh, Dem uh, Demarisus and others with them. So here he has these people that are Gentiles that are non-believers, uh, a word brought carefully, thoughtfully, and even with some punch to it, he delivers that, and there are some that believe, some that hear. Thank you very much again for your attention. Uh, may the Lord be praised as always. He is so deserving. God bless you guys.